Good morning. Welcome to the Lord's house. You will probably see, or you probably have seen from the bulletin, uh, Steve Venheisen is our preacher this morning. I am Steve, but I am not Venheisen. Pastor Steve Venheisen had a uh, emergency in his church. One of his members died last night. Um, and he said he would be here in time for the sermon, I'm hoping, and um, I will lead up to then. Otherwise, it will probably be a very short sermon today. Okay. So let's begin our worship with a time. Prayer. By the way, welcome to all of you who are here, whether you are members in uh, no paper, members of Christ, um, we're glad you're here and uh, welcome. Let's open with prayer. Father in heaven, we, your people, the sheep of your pasture, the flock of your hand, are delighted that you lead us, you care for us, you search us out, you round us up, you bring us in, you nurture us, you uh, love us, you cherish us, and you bring us with you one day to glory. We give you thanks, Lord, for your love and grace, and give you thanks for the opportunity to share that love and grace with each other, and particularly with you this morning. We pray, Lord, your blessing in our worship. May it all be pleasing in your sight. We ask this, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Song of praise is lift up your hearts into the Lord. Lift up your hearts unto the Lord. Lift up your hearts unto the Lord. Sing alleluia, sing alleluia. Lift up your hearts unto the Lord. In Christ the world has been redeemed. In Christ the world has been redeemed. Sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah. In Christ the world has been redeemed. His resurrection sets us free. His resurrection sets us free. Sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah. His resurrection sets us free. Therefore we celebrate the feast. Therefore, we celebrate the feast. Sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah. Therefore, we celebrate the feast. Sing hallelujah to the Lord. Sing hallelujah to the Lord. Sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah to the Lord. Would you join me, please, in our opening sentences? Let us worship God who reconciled us to himself through Christ. We are new creations. The old has gone, the new has come. Let us worship God as Christ's ambassadors. Through us and through our worship, may we announce the good news to all. Let us worship God in spirit and in truth. Praise God. We are reconciled, redeemed, renewed. Receive God's greeting. Reconciled, redeemed, renewed people of God. Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. By the power, presence, and operation of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 
Stephen, would you like to come forward now? Okay, all right, thank you. Okay, you may be seated. This is the second Sunday in the season of Lent, a time when Christians traditionally have focused on repentance. Of course, any time is a good and necessary time to repent of sin. But for centuries, the followers of Jesus have used this time leading up to Good Friday and Easter to carefully consider their lives and consider what is in their hearts. With this in mind, hear these words from Psalm 139. Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Notice those pronouns there. Awful lot of me. There's a need for self-introspection in the light of God's word and open ourselves up to God's inspection in the process. Let's come to the Lord in a time of silent prayer and confession. Let's acknowledge our prayers before God, our sins before God. Lord, as the song says, where sin is great, your grace is more. In that knowledge, in that hope, in that assurance, in that surety, in that confidence, we come to you, Lord, knowing that we are forgiven. We pray this, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Words of assurance come to us from... Psalm 130, Israel, put your hope in the Lord, for with the Lord is unfailing love, and with him is full redemption. He himself will redeem Israel from all their sins. Notice the completeness of that statement. Total. In that assurance, let's sing, change my heart, O oh God. Change my heart, oh God, make it ever true. Change my heart, oh God, may I be like you. You are the potter, I am the clay. Mold me and make me, this is what I pray. Change my heart, oh God, make it ever true. Change my heart, oh God, may I be like you. As our call to holy living today, I've chosen Matthew 6, verses 25 to 34. I think one of the uh, biggest challenges that I face being an old man and looking at retirement and things like that in the future is uncertainty, retirement, and uh, worry, and things like that. And this tells us you don't need to. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more important than food and the body more important than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to his life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the lilies of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today, and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, 
Will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. And here's a challenge for holy living. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Time now to come to the Lord in our congregational prayers. And um, one note, um, we celebrate with Neil Glass, nine decades of life, nine decades of uh, fruitful and uh, enjoyable life. And uh, thank you much for your presence and your blessing here. For as many of the 90 years as I have known you, you've been a blessing and uh, we uh, deeply appreciate you and thank God for your long life. Um, let's come to the Lord in prayer. There's other things we're going to pray about too, but let's uh, come to the Lord in prayer now. Father in heaven, we, your people called by your name, delighted to be forgiven, delighted to be loved. Lord, we still come to you with our concerns because we know, Lord, that you are concerned about us. Lord, we thank you for your concern for this world. We thank you, Lord, for providing us with an abundance of precipitation this week. We thank you, Lord, that in uh, many places in the West, that reservoirs have been restored. And we thank you, Lord, for your concern for this beautiful planet that you've put us on. We thank you, Lord, for rain and snow in its season. And we thank you, Lord, that... We live in uh, houses where we, for the most part, have not been outside in cardboard shacks or tents. We give you thanks, Lord, for the rich abundance that you provided for us. We give you thanks, Lord, for relatively stable government in which we can count on the government to provide services regularly. We give you thanks, Lord, for the opportunity to vote and for the freedom that you give us to worship. We give you thanks, Lord, that you have provided hospitals and the emergency services when we need them. Lord, we are richly blessed here. Now we pray your continued blessing on our country. We pray, Lord, for servant leadership, people to lead us in the way that you would have us go. Lord, you told us to pray for those who rule over us. And whether we agree or disagree with all their policies, we pray, Lord, that you will change their hearts that you will guide them and uh, lead them in your paths so that we as a country, we as a world, may better honor and bless you. We pray, Lord, for our church, our church leadership here. We pray, Lord, that you will provide us with godly men and women who will serve us and who will lead us in um, our hospitality and in our service to each other and our pastoral care for each other. Lord, we long for a pastor. It's been a long time. And we pray, Lord, for our denomination, that you will bless our denomination with stability, with harmony, with holiness, with godliness. We pray, Lord, that our denomination may be united in truth and in love, and that we may serve you in a holy way that reflects the love of Jesus and the truth and the righteousness of Jesus. Lord, we pray that you will help us as a congregation to bless each other to be truly united in our compassion, our concern, and in our grace to each other. We pray for those of our congregation who grieve. We pray, Lord, that you will comfort them, and may we be a comfort and be a family to each other. We pray, Lord, that you will be with those who uh, celebrate advanced age, and also, Lord, with that advanced age come health challenges. We pray, Lord, for us who are older, that you will help us to continue to share the wisdom that you've given us over the years. And you will also help us to continue to use the talents and gifts that you've given us in a way that reflects your grace and compassion. We pray, Lord, that you will continue to sustain the health and the uh, joy of we who are older. And we who are younger, Lord, thank you for the vitality and the youth that you've given to us. We thank you, Lord, for the strength and the initiatives and the ideas and the visions. You said, Lord, in your word that the young men will dream dreams and uh, have visions. We pray, Lord, that those visions may be realized in our church. And we pray, Lord, for growth. 
We pray, Lord, that it will continue to grow in harmony, in love, and in our reflection of Jesus Christ. We pray, Lord, also that we will continue to grow in number. Lord, we would love to see this church full again, not for our glory, but for yours. Um, thank you, Lord, for the diversity of people we see here today. Thank you, Lord, for people of every tribe, tongue, language, and nation. And uh, Lord, we pray that you will continue to bring our friends and neighbors in. We pray, Lord, that you will give us your vision for your future. And please bless the meeting today. Thank you, Lord, for Neil Glass and the nine decades of life that you've given to him. Thank you, Lord, for his joyful servanthood and his leadership that has reflected the servanthood of Jesus Christ in many ways. We pray, Lord, you continue to sustain him. And Lord, I continue our other, I include our other nonagenarians here as well. Thank you, Lord, for the many years of service that are represented by our older folks. And Lord, we ask your sustaining power and grace for them. We pray, Lord, for those in our church who struggle right now. We pray, for Lord, for those who are struggling with diseases. We pray, Lord, for those who are struggling with depression, with mental illness. We pray, Lord, for Wayne and Tammy and their family. We pray, Lord, for deliverance from their boys, for their boys, from the spirits that oppress them, for the spirit of dep depression and obsession. And Lord, we just pray for healing. Lord, do a mighty act uh, like you did of deliverance in the past and still do. Lord, increase our faith. And we pray, Lord, for healing for them. We pray, Lord, that you will bless those who struggle with uh, other health issues, cancer and allergies and other illnesses. And we pray, Lord, that you will grant wisdom, health and wholeness and joy. We pray, Lord, that you will continue to bless uh, Terry and Glenda as they uh, grieve the illness of Terry's sister. We pray, Lord, that you will comfort them and give them strength. And uh, Lord, thank you for the way that they've been an encouragement to many of us. And may they be an encouragement to their family now too. And Lord, whatever other unspoken needs of our hearts, and I'm sure I've forgotten many, Lord, you know them. And your spirit has promised, you have promised that your spirit will intercede for us with groans that words cannot express. So Lord, we just leave our hearts before you, lay our hearts before you and say, Lord, please, Give us what we stand in need of. So, Lord, I conclude with the prayer that you taught us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come and your will be done here on earth and in this congregation as it is in heaven. Lord, please continue to give us our daily bread. And please be with those who have not. Please give the daily bread of peace to our friends in Ukraine and our friends who are suffering for their faith. Lord, we pray that you will lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. But Lord, yours is the kingdom, and it's far stronger than the evil one. Yours is the power, far greater than any opposition set before us. Yours is the kingdom, the power, and yours is the glory, and may you receive it all. We ask this, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Hymn of preparation for the sermon this morning is Seek Ye First, the Kingdom of God. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. And it shall be given unto you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door shall be opened unto you. We do not 
hearts live by bread alone, words by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Good morning. Sorry for showing up late. <laughs> Sunday mornings is usually the uh, quietest time of the week uh, in our building, especially. There's just no one moving around in the morning, but I sit up on the 11th floor and the community just doesn't seem to be moving very much on a Sunday morning either. So when um, there was a knock on my door this morning, it was quite startling. And uh, one of my neighbors, who's also a member of our church, uh, was there and told me that her husband had passed away. She had been trying to get us but couldn't find her phone number, so she actually showed up on our door. So thank you, Steve, for giving me the space to spend time with her this morning. And thank you all for your patience with me as well. Can we just pray before we go any further? I just, I need to settle a little bit. Lord God, you know everything. You know where our minds and hearts are going at this very moment. You know what you have in store for us here this morning. So God, help us to rest, to relax, to allow your spirit to move in and through the preparations that we've made. Lord, we pray that your blessing would be upon not just the, the preaching, but the, the reception of your word for all of us, me too. Lord God, we're here not to witness a performance, not to laud it on anyone for how well they do. God, we're here to hear from you. And so get me and my emotions and what's going on in me, get it out of the way so that by your spirit you can move and speak and have your way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So normally I do a big long introduction, right? Well, today I'm just gonna jump right into reading scripture and we'll do a little introduction as we get going. But Matthew 13, we're gonna read uh, some select verses there because it's a rather long chapter. I don't wanna try your patience anymore there. So Matthew 13, we'll begin at the 10th verse. And I'll tell you when I'm transitioning to another section uh, as we go along. So 10 through 14 first. The disciples came to him, came to Jesus, and asked, Why do you speak to the people in parables? He replied, The knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven has been given to you, but not to them. Whoever has will be given more, and he will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken from him. This is why I speak to them in parables. Though seeing, they do not see. Though hearing, they do not hear or understand. In them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah. You will be ever hearing, but never understanding. You will be ever seeing, but never perceiving. And then to verse 24, 24 to 33. Jesus told them, <clears throat> Jesus told them another parable. <clears throat> I'm already dry. What's that about? Jesus told them <clears throat> another parable. It's not going away either. 
<clears throat> Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. When the wheat sprouted and formed heads, then the weeds also appeared. The owner's servants came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where then did the weeds come from? An enemy did this, he replied. The servants asked him, do you want us to go and pull them up? No, he answered. Because while you're pulling up the weeds, you may root up the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. At that time, I will tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned. Then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and planted in his field. Though it is the smallest of all your seeds, yet when it grows, it's the largest of the garden plants and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and perch in its branches. He told them still another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed into a large amount of flour until it worked all through the dough. Then we'll jump ahead to verse 44. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again, and then in his joy went and sold all that he had and bought that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away, sold everything that he had, and bought it. Once again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was let down into the lake and caught all kinds of fish. When it was full, the fishermen pulled it up on shore. Then they sat down and collected the good fish in baskets, but threw the bad away. This is how it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come and separate the wicked from the righteous and throw them into the fiery furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Have you understood all these things? Jesus asked. Yes, they replied. He said to them, therefore, every teacher of the law who has been instructed about the kingdom of heaven is like the owner of a house who brings out of his storeroom new treasures as well as the old. This is the word of the Lord. So I like to cook. I like to cook. I have no training. I grew up on a farm where my mom did all the cooking, so I have no previous experience. I learned how to do this as an adult, but I don't follow any recipes. I just imagine what will go well together, and then I build on my successes and my catastrophes. <laughs> but I've developed a bit of a feel for it. Uh, my method drives some people crazy, though, because they like what I serve them. And they say to me, oh, I want to serve this myself. What's the recipe? And I shrug my shoulders. I don't have a recipe. I can't tell you amounts. I can't tell you times to cook stuff. I just do it. Some of this and a little bit of that for a bit of time. That's how I do it. In Matthew 13, Jesus describes the kingdom of God. And he uses parables. He uses stories to describe the kingdom of God. 
And right from the get-go, did you see it? He's driving the disciples nuts. Can't you speak clearly? Why do you speak in parables? Just give us the recipe. Tell us the right answers. Tell us exactly what we have to do. Why does Jesus speak in parables? Why? Let's look at what might be some clues to that question, to answering that question. The first clue, parables seem to do two different things at the very same time. Parables both reveal the kingdom and they conceal the kingdom at the same time. To you have been given the secrets, Jesus says. To you it's been revealed. And to you who have, even more will be given. And then later on, disciples bring out the new treasures with the old. But then in the text also it says, whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken away. Seeing, they don't really see. Hearing, they don't listen. They don't understand. So why use parables? To reveal to some, to conceal it from others. Hmm. Second clue. Did you notice the kingdom of heaven is like, he said it, like six times in that passage. Six, six different times the kingdom of heaven is like. That must mean that the kingdom of heaven is like six different things, right? So to understand the kingdom, we're going to have to ask some questions. If the kingdom is like, if it takes at least six things to describe the kingdom, we're, we're, it, it's going to take us some time to understand the kingdom. If that's what it's like, then what does it mean? What does that look like? The second petition in the Lord's Prayer happened just a few chapters before this. Thy kingdom come is the, the second petition in the Lord's Prayer. But if you read through Matthew, you'll notice that Matthew never really describes what the kingdom is. He just starts to use that phrase. What does he mean? What is the kingdom of God? Is it asking for a literal end to the world? Are we asking God when we say, thy kingdom come, are we saying, God, get us out of here? We've had enough, end it all? Wrap it up. Two of the parables acknowledge that the end is coming. But it seems that the end in those parables is just sort of a given. They're not too worried about it. They're not very concerned. So if we're not asking for God to end the world right now, what other option do we have? What are we asking for when we say, thy kingdom come? What's the kingdom all about? Well, the only other option seems to be now. If it's not in the future, then it's now. We're asking for the work of Jesus to change the world that we live in right now. For the future that God has planned for us to start to invade our present world and reality. Parables invite the reader to ask good questions that begin to open up the kingdom of God here on earth in the reality that we engage. It's sort of like 
You understand the kingdom as you go. You learn as you go. Third clue. It's possible, it's possible to get even more of the kingdom. Those who have the secrets get more. Now, this isn't about levels of heaven that you achieve or an amount of heaven that you're able to accumulate. Jesus says, you're saved. You have that. You have the secrets. Nothing more is needed on that level. You've got it. You're set. But getting more means spreading the love. Spreading more of the kingdom, helping the kingdom to advance in various places and various situations. Helping more of that future God has for us make its way back into the present. Bringing healing and hope and restoration to more and more places and more and more lives seeking transformation wherever there's brokenness. The parables invite good questions, and good questions enable more and more of the kingdom to make its way in our world. Fourth clue. There's always something new to bring out of the storehouse. Like the owner of the house in verse 52, He brings out new treasures along with the old. The kingdom is meant to grow and to develop. There's more of the kingdom to be had in our world. The kingdom of God is not a static thing, but it's on the move. The old story continues to develop, continues to evolve in our world. Parables produce questions, and questions promote that newness, promote that development. A fifth clue. This is kind of from the original language, and it doesn't appear quite as clearly in the NIV as if you read the NRSV. But in the original language and in the NRSV, several of the parables have this preface at the beginning where it says, he put before them another parable. He put before them another parable. Now, English or or modern eyes don't necessarily see that, to see what's there. But Matthew's audience was a Jewish audience that had Jewish roots Matthew's audience would have heard something more in that line than what maybe you and I hear. Matthew's audience would have thought Moses. Moses. Because Moses, in Exodus 19 and Deuteronomy 5, Moses puts the law of God before the people of God. Jesus puts a parable before the disciples. Moses puts the law before the people of God. Jesus delivers the parable the way Moses delivered the law. In the same way that the law was meant to define the Old Testament people of God, parables, asking good questions, is meant to define a disciple's life. Final clue. There's something behind, something behind the disciples' question. They ask, why, Jesus? Why do you speak in parables? There's something behind that. There's something deeper going on here. And Matthew 13, 13 to 15, kind of gives us a bit of a clue there. It's a prophecy, Matthew refers to a prophecy of Isaiah's. And that prophecy points out what's basically the fundamental sin of Israel. Israel knew what to do. Israel had all the right answers. 
They said all the right stuff. They did all the right sacrifices at all the right times. They knew exactly what they had to do. And they assumed that that made them right with God. But Isaiah already says their hearts are calloused. Parables push the reader beyond just having the right answers. Because answers can be memorized. Acts of worship and liturgy can be performed without a change of heart. And Israel proved that. Right answers are not the answer. Parables actually conceal the kingdom. They actually conceal the kingdom from those who want just right answers. Jesus speaks in parables to shake things up. He wants his followers to find a better way than just having the right answers. He wants them to go beyond, beyond just having the right answers. So what conclusion can we draw from all these clues? Well, the parables invite the followers of Jesus to work out the meaning of the parables in their life, in their circumstance. Kind of like Paul, in, when he addresses the Philippians, when he says, Work out your salvation. Figure it out in day-to-day -day life. Apply your knowledge of the kingdom. Apply the secrets that you have received that were revealed to you. Apply them to particular circumstances, situations, discussions. Apply them. Apply them in questions about human sexuality. Apply them in discussions of reparations for indigenous peoples. Apply them in responding to this violent streak we've seen in Toronto recently. What does the future Jesus accomplished look like when it invades our world, when it invades our neighborhood, when it invades our lives, what does that future look like when the kingdom invades? What does it look like when we talk about health care reform in Canada? What does it look like when we hear of the government giving a green belt to developers. What does that mean? What does the, the future God has planned for us mean when we talk about that? What does it mean when we live in this increasingly polarized society where everybody goes to their corner and just lobs bombs at one another? Parables press us to ask good questions. They press us to ask good questions every single day in every single circumstance of our lives. Ask questions about everything. Questions that open up the kingdom of God right here, right now, in our world. So what are those questions what are some of those questions? That's where we should be sitting in a circle and start talking about these parables because that's where we start to pick the parables apart. From the seeds and the weeds parable, some things to note. God is not the author of evil. An enemy did this, the parable says. But what we want to see in this parable is that question that the disciples or the question that the servants are asking. What do we do about it? It's done. The weeds have been planted with the seeds. What do we do about it? That's the disciple. That's the servant's question. What do we do about it? Do we pull it up? Do we try to go and get rid of the weeds, get rid of the evil? 
Are we supposed to be about rooting out evil in our world? Jesus' answer, the, 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 the master's answer is unambiguous. It's not maybe or something. It's no. Do we root up evil? No. It's unambiguous. You will destroy the good if you do that. Martin Luther, theologian from way back, he understood this. This is what he says. Those who do not tolerate weeds end up with no wheat. Those who seek great holiness by getting rid of evil are no longer a church, but they are a sect. That's Martin Luther. Always looking for evil and attempting to root it out of our world can destroy our faith. Rooting out evil does not appear to be a kingdom task. The solution in the parable is leave it. Leave it. Let them coexist. Separation and judgment have to wait until the end. If that's what the kingdom of God is like, if good and evil are meant to coexist for the time being, what good questions should we be asking in order to have more of the kingdom in our world? See, this is where we should be in a circle so we can all talk to each other because you have as good ideas as what I do on this one. But let me give you a few of the questions that I think are good. Where is God at work? You name the subject. You name the discussion, whatever. Where is God at work in this discussion, in this issue, in this problem? Where is God at work? And how can I join that? What does godliness look like in this particular situation? See, this is a discussion we should keep having somewhere, right? I'm going to go through each of the parables from the mustard seed. The mustard seed was the tiniest thing that people could imagine back in that day. And tiny is always assumed to be insignificant. And yet, it produces this great bush that becomes a tree that, that birds nest in. If the kingdom is like a tiny, seemingly insignificant seed that becomes a big tree, what kind of question should we be asking to bring out the new treasures of the kingdom that are waiting there to be released. I would say, what can I do to spark, to invite newness? Whatever the situation is again, ask myself, what can I do to spark a different way of thinking, to give a new idea, to allow the kingdom of God to enter the door? How can I create even tiny instances of what God wants in our world, even if they seem so insignificant and get passed over and bulldozed? The question is, what can I do to create those instances? I don't need to create big programs. Not if the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. From the leaven, from the yeast... The yeast is introduced by the woman, and it becomes a part of the bigger mix. Really, the, the amount of yeast she threw in was about a fistful, about that much. And it was thrown into 36 quarts. That was the general size of the batch, which is, for an ex-farmer, a former farmer, a 50-pound bag. A 50-pound bag of flour and a fistful of yeast. And yet the yeast 
when it gets mixed in, influences the entire batch. In fact, if you look at it, you can't spot the yeast. If you mix it all in, you can't, you can't see it. It's, it. It gets absorbed. It gets mixed in. It's indescribable. And yet, that fistful of yeast in that 50 pound of flour transforms the entire batch and it creates enough bread to feed 100 people. If that's what the kingdom of God is like, what are our questions? What questions help us bring about the kingdom to bring about newness in our world? Am I present? Am I present where I live? Am I present where I work? Am I present in all the places of influence in my life? I'm not just talking about bodily, physically present. Am I present? Am I the presence of Jesus in all of these places? That's the question I start to ask. How can I practice the presence of Jesus in this place, in this discussion, trying to solve this problem? In what small measure, in what way can I introduce something of the newness Jesus died to bring about in this situation? From the treasure. Ooh. The man found this treasure, overwhelmed with joy, sacrifices everything that he has. If that's what the kingdom of heaven is like, if the kingdom of heaven means joyful abandonment of everything, living every moment out of the joy of, of knowing Jesus and knowing our sins are forgiven, if that's what the kingdom of heaven is like, what questions will help us realize the kingdom in our world? How deeply do I embody that joy? How evident is that joy in me and coming out of me? Is the love Jesus has shown me motivating all my thinking and all of my actions? Those are the questions of the kingdom. And then from the pearl, a man was looking, he found a pearl, again, sold everything and bought the pearl. If the kingdom of heaven is like someone completely reorienting their life when they find what they've been looking for, what questions do we ask that allow us to maintain that kind of focus? What, do, what does God want to see in this situation is what I would ask. Instead of how does this impact me, how is this going to inconvenience me, what does God want to see here? What is, what is my only comfort in life and in death? And is that at the core of all of my motivation and everything that I'm doing in this situation? And then from the net, the net caught all kinds of fish, the good get collected, the bad are thrown away, and that's compared to the end of the age. When the angels come, separate wickedness and righteousness from one another. If the kingdom of heaven is like that, this catching and sorting that the angels will do, if that's the trajectory that we're on, if that's what the kingdom, that's where the kingdom is heading, what questions should we be asking in the world that we live in today? How and where are lives being destroyed yet now? Are all creatures, is all of creation being valued and respected? How do we promote life? So how do I wrap all this up? I think I've been going on for quite a while. 
the evangelical Christian world is still a lot like the disciples. Just give us the right answers. We see that with students at York University. We set up a table in order to meet more students to let them know that we're there. But these students who are coming to us are taught to look for people who have the right answers. They're taught to question. They're taught to fear. They're taught to avoid everything that is not the right answers. We stand out there to meet people and we feel like we're being tested to see if we're on the right side. Faith seems rather churchy, rather doctrinal, and not very transformational. Students shy away from conversations that talk of being people of faith in the university setting. They shy away from conversations about being people of faith in whatever area of study or interest they're involved. I wonder to what degree we're like the disciples. Do we seek the security of right answers? Do we just join one of the sides in cultural debates? Do we dig in our heels and defend what's right? Asking good questions doesn't always feel very certain. It doesn't sound very muscular. But certainty seems to be what many people want. And yet, and yet, good questions are the path that Jesus put his disciples on. You have been given the secrets. You have them. You've been given them. There's more. There's more newness. You can have more. You can have more restoration, more transformation. Keep asking the questions. Keep asking the questions till everything is transformed, till Jesus comes again. Keep asking the questions. I've been watching a show called The Repair Shop on TV. Is anybody familiar with The Repair Shop? Well, I guess I watch too much TV. <laughs> no one? Okay, so this afternoon, go look through your TV guide and find The Repair Shop. It's a BBC show that has expert craftsmen and women repairing old and rare items that people from the audience bring in. The first few times you watch the show, you wonder. I mean, some of the stuff that's coming in is so broken down, so disre in such disrepair that you, you, you wonder, can they actually fix this? But they fix everything. I have never seen a show where they say, can't do it. They always fix it. So once you watch, and once you kind of get pulled into the, the vibe of the show, you start to assume that there's nothing in all the world that this group of people can't fix. They repair things. They rebuild things. They replace lost parts. Sometimes they fabricate new parts to make items work. Sometimes they have to research what the item looked like over a hundred years ago, so that they know how to put it back together. But again, everything, every last thing gets fixed. It's a show that exudes hope and confidence that whatever is wrong can be made right. I tell you what, it makes me want to go get my tools and start fixing stuff. 
I think, I think that if Jesus were on earth today, instead of over 2,000 years ago, he wouldn't talk about a man who owns a house in order to illustrate the kingdom character of disciples. He wouldn't talk about that, verse 52, that, that, that homeowner that brings out different treasures. This is what I think Jesus would say. People that know and teach the Old Testament and then encounter the kingdom of God are like people who watch the repair shop. People who know the law, who know the Old Testament story, and then are confronted with the kingdom of God are like people who watch the repair shop. They believe nothing is beyond repair. They exude hope and confidence that whatever is wrong can and will be fixed. They ask good questions, questions that release the newness, the joy, and the power of the kingdom of God here on earth as it already is in heaven. They get busy. They get busy making it happen here on earth right now. The secrets of God have been revealed to us. We know Jesus. He has ushered in the new kingdom. It's already here. We have it. We have it. And to those who have, even more will be given. Lord, we need more, don't we? In our world, we need more, more of the kingdom, more newness, more repair, more hope. Lord, keep us asking good questions, questions that re release renewal and restoration and abundance. Amen. Lord God, thank you for your word. Thank you for entrusting us with parables, Jesus. Thank you for knowing us so well Asking questions would keep us on track better than having right answers. God, you've given us everything that we need. We know Jesus. Our lives here and forever are secure in Jesus. We know that. But you've said that we can have even more of the kingdom. So God, we want more. We want more in the brokenness of our own lives. We want more in the brokenness of our city, our country, and our world. Lord God, help us to be asking good questions. Questions that release that newness. Questions that put us into contact with people. Questions that engage us in the situations and the struggles and the discussions of our world. Lord, help us to be there. To be there as the presence of Jesus himself. Help us not to try to run the show or create a program that fixes things forever, but God, help us to be there as yeast in a batch of flour. Help us to be willing to practice the small kingdom the way a mustard seed grows into something that birds can nest in. Lord God, thank you for this challenge. 
Help us to be engaged in this conversation. Let your church here and around the city and around the world be talking about what does the kingdom of God mean right here and right now. And God, let us be your light, your hope, your healing to this world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to play a video now, I believe. Is that the correct order? The, the video from Logos? Or is that coming later? We're going to sing the song first? Okay. We'll sing the song, and then there's going to be a video, and I'll give you a little intro on that. We seek your kingdom throughout every sphere. We long for heaven's demonstration here. Jesus, your light shine bright for all to see. Transform, revive, and heal society. Before all things, in Him were all things made. Inspiring culture, media, and trade. Serve your economy, transform, revive, and heal society. Peace, truth, and justice reigning everywhere. With us be present. In our public squares, fill all who lead with your integrity. Transform, revive, and heal society. Forgive us, Lord, when we have no Failing to scribe your heart on history's page. Make us again what we were made to be. Transform, revive, and heal society. Faithful to govern, ever may we be. Selfless in service, loving constantly. In everything, may your authority transform, revive, and Society. So a brief video that kind of goes on the heels of that song and the message, and it's something that you're partnering in doing through the team that's doing ministry through Logos at York University. So I thank you for your partnership, and this is sort of a report so you see what's going on. So Go ahead. The 
say that our society is becoming increasingly polarized is an understatement. For this reason, Logos Campus Ministry at York University in Toronto is exploring tools to navigate difficult conversations, primarily through listening circles. Students are challenged to assess their own reactions and those of others from the vantage point of social, intellectual, emotional, and faith perspectives, which cause one participant to reflect, this is changing me. Logos offers weekly drop-in spaces for students who are looking for theological, physical, personal, and spiritual conversation. Some of the things that we're doing right now are visual poetry, mentoring leaders, biblical reflection, and theology over jazz. During the seasons of Advent and Lent, all are invited to gather virtually for brief yet meaningful evening prayers to conclude our day. Students actively organize and participate in these ancient prayers and extemporaneous intercessions for each other and our world. Some have even said, I can see that my non-Christian friends could join and be impacted too. These prayers are healing. They touch on something core to be human that could benefit everyone. Through our integral leader program, we're able to place students and other young adults in the surrounding community in a way that complements their studies or interests. They engage with those on the front lines of food security and health, housing and well-being, youth leadership and development. With a mentor, they then reflect on what they're doing from the perspective of their faith. This learning contributes to their lifelong kingdom service in whatever community they live. Despite pandemic closures over the past few years, we have been privileged to meet many new students coming from all over Canada and the world, as well as around the greater Toronto area. Our campus ministry is poised to bring relevance to their studies as their view of the world is shaped by fate and inquiry. Logos continues to advance God's work with gratitude to individuals and churches that support our vision to experience, engage, and extend community. Thank you for letting me share that with you. Brothers and sisters, the Gospels tell us that on the first day of the week, the day on which our Lord rose from the dead, he appeared to some of his disciples and was made known to them in the breaking of bread. So come then to this joyful feast of our Lord. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right for us to give thanks. It is our joy and our peace at all times and in all places to give thanks to you, Holy Father, almighty, everlasting God, through Christ our Lord. We bless you for your continual love and care for every creature. We praise you for forming us in your image and calling us to be your people. We, th <clears throat> we thank you that you did not abandon us in our rebellion against your love, but sent prophets and teachers to lead us in the way of salvation. Above all, we thank you for sending Jesus, your son, to deliver us from the way of sin and death by the obedience of his life, by his suffering upon the cross, by his resurrection from the dead. We praise you that he now reigns with you in glory and ever lives to pray for us. We thank you for the Holy Spirit who leads us into truth, defends us in adversity, and out of every people unites us into one holy church. Therefore, the whole company of saints in heaven and on, therefore, with the whole company of saints in heaven and on earth, we worship and glorify you, God most holy, and we sing with joy. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, all thy works shall praise thy name in earth. 
earth and sky and sea. Holy, 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 merciful and mighty God in three persons, blessed Trinity. We give thanks to God the Father that our Savior Jesus Christ, before he suffered, gave us this memorial of his sacrifice until he comes again. The Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We shall proclaim that was sent by the Father into the world, that he took upon himself our flesh and blood and bore the wrath of God against our sin. We confess that he was condemned to die that we might be pardoned and suffered death that we might live. We proclaim that he is risen to make us right with God and that he shall come again in the glory of his creation. This we do now and until he comes again. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, show forth among us the presence of your life-giving word and Holy Spirit to sanctify us and your whole church through this sacrament. Grant that all who share the body and blood of our Savior Jesus Christ may be one in him and may, re may remain faithful in love and hope. And as this grain has been gathered from many fields into one loaf and these grapes from many hills into one cup, grant, O Lord, that your whole church may soon be gathered from the ends of the earth into your kingdom. Now, as your, our Savior Christ has taught us, we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thy name is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I invite the serving elders to come forward. The bread which we break, the bread which we break is a sharing in the one body of Christ.
Remember and believe that the body of Jesus was broken for the forgiveness of our sins and for the restoration of our lives. The cup for which we give thanks is a sharing in the blood of Christ. Take, drink, remember and believe the precious blood of our Lord Jesus Christ was shed for the complete forgiveness of all of our sins and for the restoration of our lives. Congregation in Christ, since the Lord has fed us at his table, let's praise his holy name with thanksgiving using these words of Psalm 103. Praise the Lord. Oh, my soul, all my inmost being, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, oh, my soul, and forget not all his benefits. He forgives all my sins and heals all my diseases. He redeems my life from the pit and crowns me with love and compassion. Sired with good things, so my youth is renewed like the eagle's. Further response of gratitude will be in our offerings, which you can leave at the back on your way out. The offering today is for the Canadian Food Grains Blank Bank. And now we'll sing a song. Uh, just before our closing song, I wanted to remind all of our members that we have a congregational meeting. But I was going to ask, can we take a five-minute break after the benediction before we go into it? Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. He has done great things, he has done great things, he has done great things, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy Peace of God, 
which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. And all God's people said, go in peace to love and serve the Lord.